Good morning. I'm Tyler McCann, Managing Director at the Canadian Agri-Food Policy Institute, and I'm pleased to moderate today's webinar, After E-Day, The Challenges and Opportunities of Canada's Federal Government. Thank you for joining in this important discussion as we look to understand where agri-food policy is going and where it should go over the next four years. This is also the first webinar with all four of our new CAPI Distinguished Fellows. While we are meeting virtually today, I want to take a moment to acknowledge the First Nations on whose traditional territories we sit as we watch our screen. As we approach Canada's first National Day of Truth and Reconciliation, this is more important than ever. I am in Western Quebec and CAPI's head office is in Ottawa, so I would like to recognize the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation whose traditional and unceded territory we are and would be gathered on today. Now, established 17 years ago, CAPI is a neutral policy think tank focused solely on the agri-food sector, bringing insight, evidence, and creative solutions to agri-food policymakers by creating venues for critical conversations, explaining research results to a broader audience, and being a connector between those who have creative ideas to contribute and those who are making impactful policy decisions. As you know, there are major opportunities and risks on the horizon. The past year has reminded us of the importance of an agri-food system that is resilient to disruption. We also need a system that can meet increasing global demand for high quality affordable food, a system that enables us to innovate, to, to find climate adaptations, and a system that can be profitable for all of those involved. At the same time, we must set Canada's agri-food system apart in an increasingly competitive and complex global environment. We need to find new ways to drive growth through innovation, creative thinking, and ideas rooted in science and good public policy. Now, we can only achieve this by working together. Policy development is a team sport, and we develop better policy when we do it together. CAPI is looking for partners to diversify our knowledge and our finances. Through your partnership, CAPI can continue to be the institution where Canada's agri-food system comes together to create bold, innovative, strategic policy thinking. CAPI has benefited from the support of Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada over the last 15 years, support that we are grateful for. But we also recognize the need to diversify our support as we look to the future. Please reach out to myself or Bree Jones, Director of Fundraising, to explore the different opportunities and join CAPI and join the CAPI mailing list to ensure you stay up to date for CAPI webinars and research throughout the year. Now, I'd like to take the opportunity, and it's my pleasure to announce and share with you the details of our four distinguished fellows: Dr. Ellen Goddard, Dr. Susan Woodbaum, Nicolas Mesli, and Ted Billier. This is a new initiative for CAPI. And these distinguished fellows will contribute to our thriving and sustainable agri-food system by providing that aspirational leadership, engaging in strategic thinking, encouraging systems approaches, and helping to build public-private partnerships and that leverage CAPI's tr transdisciplinary research to drive transformational change. CAPI's distinguished fellows will use their extensive experience to lead projects over the next year. They will build on our interdisciplinary approach leverage data and insights from across the agri-food system, and translate that into actionable next steps. Fellows will also act as ambassadors and keep encouraging deeper, bolder policy thinking about critical issues affecting Canada's agri-food system. Now, I will take the opportunity to introduce a fellow and ask them a question to start off our discussion today. I'd like to start with Dr. Ellen Goddard. Dr. Goodard is, has been a professor and cooperative chair in agricultural marketing and business at the University of Alberta since December 2000. She was previously a National Australia Bank Professor of Agribusiness and Associate Dean Coursework at the Institute of Land and Food Resources at the University of Melbourne. Before that, Dr. Goddard worked at the Department of Agricultural Economics at the University of Guelph. Over the past 30 years, Dr. Goddard's research has been focused on economic modeling of domestic and international markets for food products, particularly meat, for policy analyst analysis purposes. Her current research includes various aspects of food behavior, including co consumer responses to food safety incidents, consumer interests in labels, demand for 
credence attributes, traceability, and certification. She has also been and remains a core social science researcher in five large livestock genomics projects on identifying genes related to animal disease resilience, on identifying genes related to feed efficiency, and on identifying and undertaking surveillance for disease animals. Dr. Goodard's project with CAPI will focus on One Health. And so Ellen, I'd like to start by asking you um, about, uh, about One Health, you know, issues around the pandemic and pandemic management were a constant theme during the campaign and, and of course are gonna be a priority for governments for the foreseeable future. We all know that COVID-19 has impacted the agri-food system, but I think for the most part, it underscored how resilient Canada's food production system is. Uh, COVID-19 is also a reminder of the connection that exists between human and animal health and the potential impact of, of zoonotic diseases. I think often for, for many people, that was a theoretical impact before, but now it's clear what that connection is like. That connection is, is an an important element of One Health, this concept that considers the interactions between animal, plant, and human health and the health of the environment that they live in. As, as you look to build that conceptual framework for One Health and what that means in the Canadian context, I'm interested in your thoughts around um, how, you, how you see COVID as a One Health issue, you know, how it relates to African swine fever and antimicrobial resistance, and, and what that might look like for governments in the next mandate. In particular, I'd like to hear your thoughts around what actions you're gonna be watching for to see if governments are thinking about One Health as they approach all of these issues. Thanks, Tyler. It's nice to be here. Um, one of the things that I think is really important that happened during COVID is all the science that happened. Um, it wasn't only vaccines that got developed. We studied an awful lot of other things that it, is going to spill over to our study of animal diseases. And that puts us uh, globally ahead of where we were um, before COVID. And some of that will start coming out once we get past uh, worrying about people's health in this extreme um, fourth phase of the pandemic. But I, I really think in the mandate letter to the Minister of Agriculture, I would like to see a higher profile for the potential of these kind of diseases to continue to come in the future. The Minister of Agriculture has to take a core role in terms of facilitating national responses to um, livestock diseases, to diseases in wildlife that can cross over to livestock, to diseases in wildlife that cross over potentially to people or diseases in livestock that come from people and um, go back to other livestock potentially. All of those pathways we understand exist, but they're being studied by compartment. Um, and we don't even have consistent approaches to dealing with some of these disease issues when there are wildlife, livestock, people interactions. It's not even clear what ministry is in charge. Um, it could be sometimes the Ministry of Environment or Natural Resources that deals with the wildlife side, the Minister of Agriculture or the Canadian Food Inspection Agency deals with livestock. And uh, the human health thing is aware, but not, not actively participating often. And I think Canada has been lucky so far with antimicrobial resistance compared to some of our Euro European countries who are um, dramatically reducing the use of antimicrobials in livestock production because of the development of antimicrobial resistant bacteria that are affecting human health. And we need to knock that on the head soon or it's going to get away from us. So there are a number of challenges coming down the pipeline and they need to be facilitated through a federal ministry interacting with other ministries, but also leading the provinces um, in terms of these actions. Great, Th thank you, Ellen. And uh, again, lots to dig, in dig into thereafter. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Susan Woodbone. Susan is president and CEO of Woodbone and Associates. She offers strategic uh, consulting services to the industry and government in the areas of science-based innovation, research and development investment, and integrated solutions deployment. 
Dr. Woodbaum's particular expertise and the role that biological systems can play in climate change mitigation and adaptation has influenced policy and investment decisions at the provincial and national levels through Alberta Innovates Biosolutions, the Climate Change and Emissions Management Corporation, Emissions Reductions Alberta, the BioCap Foundation, and Bioindustrial Innovation Canada, and within global organizations such as the United Nations through the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Now, Susan, um, climate change and environment policy, unlike One Health, was certainly at the forefront of the campaign. It was one of the areas, I think, where we saw a real policy debate amongst the parties. While not necessarily front and center in the agriculture context, there was certainly debate about the environment, including the impacts of the carbon tax and possible exemptions for farmers, the government's commitment to reduce nitrogen emissions by 30%, and the role that on-farm action can play in emission reductions and carbon sequestration. You know, Susan, you've been working on agriculture and environment policy since long before it became a fixture of, of election campaigns. I'd like to hear your thoughts on, on where we are in the state of agriculture and environment policy dialogue during the campaign and, and more generally recently in Canada. And in particular, what do you think governments are getting right and, and what they're getting wrong? Oh, well, thank you, Tyler. It's a great question. And good morning, everyone. Um, I think what I want to focus in on is the is the concept that we have a government which is carrying on in many ways. We're we're not looking at uh, restructuring because of a, a change in partisan politics. So it gives us the opportunity to look at what's in what's been in front of us, what's been put in front of us over the last year or so, and what's the performance on that. Um, one of the documents that I'd like to refer to is the Pan-Canadian Framework on Clean Growth and Climate Change, which shows this government's intent to link economic recovery, uh, post-COVID of course, to, uh, to climate change and what we can do that is going to serve both our climate change goals and targets and what we can do at the same time to meet our economic goals. I have to say that on careful consideration that pan-Canadian uh, climate framework document is actually quite sound. Um, the difficulty is that we haven't done a whole lot with it uh, just yet. There's been some programs that have been rolled out. Uh, we tend not to hear about them as they pertain to agriculture. We tend to hear about them as they pertain to climate change. And so I think one of the things if I was going to start on the wrong side of the equation that government doesn't do particularly well is that they, they don't speak the language of agriculture, which is just tremendously important uh, both uh, economically for Canada and economically globally. And so I, I would say that the government needs to learn to speak the language of agriculture and understand that um, agriculture is a, is a viable functioning uh, economic force in this country, as well as a force for good on uh, helping us address our issues of climate change. Um, in, in terms of getting it right, they've got some documents, they've got this, this uh, framework document that I've been talking about, and they've also developed an annex document on climate smart agriculture, which shows, again, this uh, intention to, to be focused on what we can do both to reduce emissions associated with agriculture and to uh, look on the, on the benefit side what agriculture can do in many ways to help us uh, address our climate change goals. But again, it's a framework document. It hasn't been fleshed out and there haven't been real actions. So I think going forward, we're going to be looking for actions coming out of the government. Um, and that needs to happen in partnership with our the producer organizations and primary producers themselves. We need to hear the voices of the primary producers. So I'll leave it there for now, Tyler. There's lots we can come back to, okay? Great, great, thank you, Susan. Uh, Our next uh, distinguished fellow is Mr. Nicolas Mesli, who is uh, someone uh, focused on agri-food and ecology. He started uh, first with agriculture and 
he was uh, an economic columnist and earlier in his career, Mr. Messi was press secretary to Canada's former Minister of Agriculture, Eugene Wellen, Senior International Marketing Officer at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada and Commercial Secretary at the Canadian Embassy in Caracas, Venezuela. Mr. Messi then worked as a freelance correspondent for CBC's flagship public affairs program, Le Point, based in Santiago, uh, Chile. Since then, he has collaborated with various magazines and newspapers, as well as in the production of documentaries. He has extensive international experience and has been covering U.S. agricultural policy for the past 15 years. The Canadian press associations have rewarded his work on more than 20 occasions. He's a speaker and host, as well as a columnist on the CBC radio program, Moteur de Recherche. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, your uh, project, and there is a question that uh, certainly has an effect on uh, the supply uh, chain. I think that our participants today will agree that we didn't really hear anything uh, about water during the electoral campaigns. Yet, uh, over the next four years, we can expect water issues ranging from lack of it on the prairies to having too much of it in Eastern Canada and the role it plays, water plays in maintaining and attracting food processing in Canada will play a greater role. I would like to know, Nicola, how do you see the dialogue around water policies playing out over the next four years? Do you think there are issues on the horizon that will focus attention on water? Yes, hello. Thank you, Tyler, for this introduction. And hello, everybody. We didn't hear any talk about uh, water during the federal electoral campaign. And uh, that is unfortunate because water will be the issue for the 21st century. Water, mostly in climate change, what we can expect is that when a nation like Canada, which is the fifth exporter uh, for agricultural products, when we do exports, we export water. And Canada, in that sense, is a bit, a bit blessed by the gods, I'd say, because we have 17% of fresh water in uh, the world. Uh, we say that the planet is blue, but most of that water is salted water, and therefore to produce uh, food, Canada is well placed, the provinces as well. And I would say that one of the issues that we'll have to analyze is to see what happens in the provinces. What are the rules? Uh, provincial issues, uh, policies, do they interfere? What are the rules? How are producers affected from one province to the other? Say we take the west of Canada. Sometimes there's a, a conflict between gas and oil and the farmers with uh, fracking technologies, or again, uh, west of Canada, a lack of water. So we would have to do new pipelines. Uh, uh, this requires infrastructure. This, I would say, is one of the chapters we will be looking with uh, CAPI. The other one is that I would say that the agreement signed is not uh, very clear. Uh, the previous uh, NAFTA, uh, what would be, I'd say, is water uh, commodity? Uh, for example, bottled water, is that a commodity? We pay uh, the tariffs, we export, but what happens mostly with climate change as far as water as such goes? Can we export water uh, in general to the US? What's the status of water? And that will give a major concern because it's underwater. We don't see it, but Canada, uh, like uh, business people, want to know what's happening. Canadians want to know what's happening. And if we are in a resilient system, 
a resilient agri agri food system, then we'll have to have water policies and management and we'll have to save the water. So it's a little bit that and to finish, I have the privilege of being able to work with CAPI, with all the expertise that there is there and with the network, we will be able to talk about those issues. Thank you very much, Nicola. I find that it will be great to work with you and with all the team. And I'd like to say once again, that here at CAPI, we really like an interdisciplinary approach. And I have, and I think that you all have different expertises, experiences, and you all though have a passion for agri-food issues and for policy approaches that are shared by all of you. To, to Cappy, we, uh, I, I've had the, got to know, know Ted over the last year as I've been here and, and um, uh, have, uh, have valued the opportunity to work with him. I, so, so Ted is, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Ted Billier is an agri-food consultant specializing in, in innovation with clients in both the private and public sector. Uh, Ted has uh, served uh, recently as the chief strategy officer here at CAPI and is a past chair and special advisor to our board. Uh, previously, uh, Ted retired in 2005 as executive vice president at Maple Leaf Foods, having spent a very successful 35 years with the company. Prior to becoming executive vice president, uh, he held the position of president of Maple Leaf Foods International from 1995 to 2004. Earlier in his career with the antecedent company Canada Packers, uh, Ted led teams that pioneered the export of chilled beef from Canada and was the first in North America to export chilled pork to Asia. Under his uh, leadership, Maple Leaf Foods entered the, oh, I've lost my page, Ted, on your bio. Um, I think you've said enough. <laughs> there. Well, why don't we go right? Why don't we go right to right to right to the question again? I mean, I, I think Ted, what what that bio probably the next page probably says is that that your experience in international affairs and in international trade and marketing is 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 quite significant, and and that's uh, part of the value you're going to bring to your research project, where you're going to look at the role that food and and food exports and and Canada's natural resources and and, and some of these issues that we've already talked about today can play in a more strategic approach to foreign affairs and, and trade. You know, I think th throughout the campaign, there was a, uh, many commentators noted that there was little attention paid to foreign affairs and trade issues, despite the fact that the, the campaign launched as Afghanistan was, was falling and, and, and Canada was, was left outside of a new US, UK and Australia security partnership. Uh, the, the dynamic, the dynamics in, in, in foreign affairs and trade continue to change. And last week, we were we were lucky to finally see the release of Michael Spavord and Michael Kovrig. You know, I, I think there's again agreement, Ted, that that this this changing landscape points to the need for Canada to reshape its foreign affairs strategy. I wonder if you could just speak to again how you see agri-food fitting into that strategy, and how can Canada leverage these issues we've talked about, One Health. Sustainable on-farm climate action and 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 uh, climate change mitigation and water to advance Canadian interests uh, around the world. Thanks, Tyler. Um, I think this is a terribly important subject. Um, if you when when you think about what the other three panelists have said, really the they have outlined what is really a very strategic position for Canada. You know, we have um, abundance of, uh, of um, raw materials, particularly food, energy, and material and, and, and minerals. Um, you, the, world, the world can be as brilliant as it wants with all kinds of other discoveries, but it can't live without those basic things. It, 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 you know, and and my, my concern is that we have a you know, a lot of cards are probably a potentially a winning hand strategic, strategically, but I'm not sure that we know exactly how to play those cards very well. That is, it's so. Um, I think my interest this year is going to be looking at how do we play those cards. Um, 
you know, obviously we are in a situation where, well, let's go back a little bit of history. What built Canada, especially in the, in the meat business was the fact that we could go any to any market because we had uh, essentially a um, uh, high animal health. And that was worth it sometimes as much as a dollar a kilo, you know, over what a country with foot and mouth disease would have to uh, get rid of their meat at. And similarly, our crops, which were very uh, cl clean, low residue crops, they could go to those same high premium markets and were in demand everywhere because people needed them to blend with the junk that they had to buy from elsewhere. And so Canada has always had that positioning. And, the, and it, it's, we're now we're moving in, though into a world where all of a sudden um, climate change is going to play a role. Water is going to play a role. Um, many countries are going to have to meet uh, these climate uh, commitments that they are making, and we're beginning to. We can see already in the uh, in the, um, the many reports that have been done on the EU strategy that that's going to cut their production, and somewhat significantly. Um, in the uh, in the same, it's rather interesting. The same um, thing is happening already in China. Most people haven't caught on to the fact yet that uh, you know it's uh, the fact that we're we're shipping fewer soybeans uh, this um, September than we and than was expected, and part of that is not just the fact that the uh, Chinese um, you know hog industry is going through another problem, um, but it is all, but is because there's not enough electricity to run the crushing plants, so there's close to twenty of the major crushers in China that are unable to operate as they would normally. They simply can't get electricity. And the, the reason for that is, is twofold. One, we want blue skies, but more importantly, Xi Jinping has made some very interesting commitments for climate neutrality by 2060. And, the, and in fact, pressure is mounting to make that happen sooner. So I think we're, we're in a new world, um, you know, in fact. And we don't recognize the hand that we have to play. Similarly, um, as what Nicholas was talking about, you know, from the water perspective, many countries are being are already being forced to divert water from agriculture to cities, and in some cases to preserve biodiversity. That's happening fairly close to home in California rivers right now. And so that, along with the fact that I think it's become you know, recognized that you can only have certain animal densities to a point where you're guaranteed of disease and you're gonna have many more coming. So I think all of those you know, would tend to suggest to us that we should be thinking more strategically about how we play with our trade policy. And um, I think the, uh, the, the possibilities there are, are, are quite significant where we can gain leverage and use it for good purpose, not just you know, to make money, but actually you know, to have a better world, a sustainable world, a more peaceful world than we have today. So I think I'm gonna stop there because I have no intention of, 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 of writing that strategy right now. We've got a year to work on it. Thanks. Great. Uh... Thank, thank, thank you, Ted. And, and again, you know, in all of your answers, I think you know we we could spend spend the whole afternoon uh, talking about the dynamics and, and and how they're going to play out over the next four years. But but uh, we're going to change gears and, and start to ask some general questions. And I'd encourage everyone that's that's listening to to feel free to use the the Q and A function to send questions in a, in as well if if there are questions you'd like to hear uh, our, our four panelists speak to. Um, but I'm going to start uh, with one uh, that I think is a fun one, um, and this question will be for for everyone. If you were prime minister writing the mandate letter to the new minister or the the next minister of agriculture and agri food, what would you give them as job number one for the next mandate? And so um, maybe we'll we'll go start in that that same order that that we were in. So so Ellen, I'll, I'll go to you first. What what's job number one for the next agriculture minister? Um, I, I could be no. Nope. Ellen, have you? I think we've uh, potentially lost Ellen for a moment. Oh, so maybe see. we'll come back. And oh. I have agri. Oh. Sorry, Ellen. I'm... I think I think that you froze for a minute. 
Sorry. David, can I get you to start again? Can, you, can I get you to start again, please? Okay, sorry about that. My internet's a bit wonky today. Um, a, a few mandate letters ago, the Prime Minister sent the Minister of Agriculture um, a requirement that uh, the Minister develop a food policy for Canada, which was kind of an intriguing concept to a ministry that had mostly worked on agricultural production and not worried about many aspects of food policy, and it became a challenge. I, I really think that animal disease is in the same um, mandate. Um, we are a global world. We're not gonna stop being a global world as Ted has said. We can't stop people, animals or food from moving around the world. And we are really um, at, at risk if we don't address these issues seriously and get in front of them so that we can guarantee the quality of our Canadian product for Canadian citizens and um, for our export markets. And I, I think so, a lot of disease issues are flowing under um, people's uh, agendas. So I would say develop um, a One Health policy that is going to guarantee um, the quality of Canadian um, food exports. Right. No. No small task for the next minister. No. Uh, Susan, your, your thoughts on, on job number one for the next agriculture and agri-food minister? Well, I tend to think of a mandate letter as something that has broad brushstroke principles and then some get it done little bits uh, associated with it. So I want to drag us back pre-COVID. And in 2017, we had the release of uh, the Dominic Barton report which offered some specific guidance on the potential for agriculture to lead uh, an economic recovery for Canada. And I think it's really interesting that we've, we're, we're now in a position where we have a, a quite a fundamental economic recovery that we need to address. At the time, the Dominic uh, Barton report suggested that we could lead Canada's economic recovery by responding to the needs of the global markets, and that includes carbon. Um, by addressing the increasing protein demands and by developing trusted partners. Those three things seem awfully relevant uh, today. So um, as broad brushstrokes, my, my hope would be that uh, this mandate letter would say, okay, you've got the Barton Report, it's a good one. We've all agreed it's a good one. Get on with delivering it. And by the way, in the meantime, you have to look after some basic underpinnings. We've got to fix the risk management issue address uh, access to capital for primary producers. And, and it's, it was so timely, Ellen, that we, we unfortunately watch you freeze, but that's, that addresses another really key issue. And it, we cannot move forward um, with pre precision agriculture or data management or anything else if we don't have access to high quality, affordable internet straight across the country. So I'll leave it there. That's my wish list. Right. Great. <laughs> Thank you. And, and so, uh, Nicolo, what, what's um, what, what's your your view on whether is job number one different than, than what we've we've heard before? Um, I think one of um, the main issue for Canada agriculture is uh, health soil, and the 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 minister, the agriculture minister, uh, is trying to have uh, farmers to put. Uh, to increase their organic matter in their soil. It's part of the strategy to fight uh, climate change. But this is, this, this is uh, and we look, when you look Eastern Canada and Western Canada, in Western Canada, they do much, uh, much less, how could I say, uh, no-till work. But in Eastern Canada, it's not the case. So there's a real emergency here uh, to put emphasis on soil health in Canada, at least in certain part, because uh, honestly, it has been uh, driven more on corn and soya and uh, pumping out the organic matter. This has, there's, there's an emphasis to be done there. The second thing, if I, and I just want to say what Susan say and Ellen was very, very uh, appropriate. I would add to that is that under Mr. Trump, there has been Trump dollars, a lot, of, almost, if my, my, uh, my number is right, something around $40 billion uh, 
to basically, and I'm honest with that, I did an interview on that, to buy uh, the vote, farmer's vote to take up, uh, to take uh, upon China. These for Canadian agriculture or Canadian producers is that we, uh, uh, we haven't, uh, how could I say, it's all that money is being invested in, in US farms and we don't have in Canada the same envelope and our program, which are called the agri uh, system to protect our revenue. And by the way, I'm just saying that Mr. Almussel did a super paper on that from CAPI. And uh, basically what I'm trying to say is that we, it, it's, it's the, the tree who um, occurred a forest in the sense that um, American producers are, are well, but our system in Canada, our, our agri system works when the price of international commodities are low. Well, it's not the case because China is, is pulling all those price up. So we have, a, uh, we have to think of something here in terms of, uh, uh, of uh, competitivity. How are we gonna do it? And the last thing I would, I would say is that as um, Susan say, is that, uh, uh, you know, we're talking about the agriculture minister, but the agriculture minister and then the environment minister is two, two things, but water is in between. Also with the health system, so you see, there's a lot of things to be, uh, to be discussed. It's quite a challenge. And I agree with Ted also, I mean, in the sense that uh, we need to play our cards right. And it will be a tough game in the next, uh, it's an opportunity, but in the same time, we, we have to bring all those issues to the public and discuss it with the farmers too. Right. Thank you. I, I think that that uh, comment about playing our cards right is an interesting one. I think, uh, you know, over the years, we may have not had to play our cards. I think we've we've had factors working working in our favor, but I think that those those dynamics that that allowed us to get to where we are today um, are changing. And and so again, we, we're being forced. Government's going to have to make make more more questions. T Ted, again, if you were going to tell the agriculture minister which card to play first, which which card would it be? Oh, you're on mute, well, Ted. Yeah, I, I, I think Tyler, I'll, I'll change the, uh, uh, the example and I'll say, we probably have to go from the cards, we've probably got to go to chess. So I'd like to see us play a lot less whack-a-mole um, and, and we may have to up the game to serious chess because it's, it's, it's kind of that important. So I'd, I'd really like to, uh, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more with all of the speakers so far and they, they've taken all the wonderful points. So I'll go in a slightly different direction and I'd say that I'd like to see the minister put greater emphasis on the strategic importance of agriculture and food as key to our health, our climate, our environment, our economy, and so many other files. So really, we're going to have to get the ag minister in, is going to have to lead on some of these files as well as, as just be a doer. And we, we need to sh also shift um, a shift in the shared responsibility of the um, federal government and the provincial governments. And we need, to, we, we need to see that shift move from what we've talked about as kind of firefighting, you know, um, to, uh, to more and reaction to more foresight and joint strategic planning with all the stakeholders involved. And my suggestion there would be that as a starting point, we might want to think about reactivating the Outlook Conference where we share with the industry a, a you know knowledge and because if we're going to come to any kind of strategic agreements where we're going to recognize we have short-term problems that have to get solved and we we've listed all those but there are some really strategic long-term issues here that we need to work on then we need a place where we bring people together which is share information and I, so i think CAPI would be a really good partner of the federal and provincial governments to kind of help organize and, and get and maybe take that outlook conference out of the government and put it outside in an organization that's neutral like CAPI that we can bring these kind of things together that we've just heard. Right, uh, I, I agree Ted, I think, think that that's a really, really interesting uh, point you made and, and, and um, go to one of the questions that's come up in, in, in the chat. So, so when you talk about that more strategic ap approach, when you talk about playing that 
that chess game, where where do competitiveness and innovation fit into that? And 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 again, so maybe go to you first, Ted. But if any of the other fellows want to comment on this after, uh, would welcome welcome that. Tyler, it's it's absolutely critical. Um, the one of the things that I felt was really left out. Um, in the discussions um, leading up to the election was exactly that. You know, the, the developed world and Canada included has, uh, we, we've kind of seen a significant decline in, in research and development in the ag sphere. Certainly the um, government portion of that has declined, but in Canada, unfortunately, the business portion of that has declined as well. Whereas in, in, uh, in the developing countries, interestingly enough, China, for example, and Brazil, the, uh, the, the non-governmental portion of that has actually risen. So we're, we're actually in a situation where we're seeing others take on some of these more interesting um, R&D portions of it. And we have not proven very good at the commercialization of some of that stuff. Some of the history of Canada, uh, agriculture in Canada has really been built on, on some firsts that we did do. You know, we were the first in, in, the, in the Americas to actually turn our a hog herd from lard hogs, which were basically built for lard, uh, into uh, an exportable meat product. Uh, William Davies, who, you know, built the uh, Canada Packers, imported the first genetics. And, and then we built, we, we became world leaders in genetics in, 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 uh, in both hogs and cattle. Um, similarly, we, we, we discovered a new crop and, and the entire industry worked on that. There wasn't one person. When canola was, was built, it was a huge success. We, 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 we cheer on the, the seed portion of that, but you know, there was a lot of chemistry involved with that, that my old company was deeply involved in, in trying to figure out how you actually produce oil out of that stuff, you know, that people could eat. So we we're, we've seen a real decline in that, and and it, it with the, you know, with with obvious problem with climate change, we need productivity improvements to to race ahead way beyond where they are today. We're not going to get there unless we actually devote more time and energy, both um, from government and from and business and businesses directly into R and D um, in agriculture and food research. Great, thank you, Ellen. Uh, your thoughts? Um, I, I couldn't agree with Ted more, so I'm, I'm not going to repeat any of that, but we really have to look at our funding models overall. I mean, a lot of um, my agricultural economics colleagues will tell you that um, developed countries in general are spending less and less, even though the rates of return to agricultural research and innovation are so important for the entire food industry. But that being said, have we got the right mix of public and private investment? Are we doing things in a way that's gonna benefit Canadian society and global society um, in the best way? Are, have we got the right decision makers at the table? Sometimes decision makers are only focused on today's problems. So where are the solutions to tomorrow's and further out problems coming from if we're not investing in the right research and innovation? And clearly, Every aspect of genomics, um, we, we're under investing in the commercialization end of things to, to an incredible extent where we could be advantaging those things. Great. Thank you. Susan? I'd just add uh, to Ted's very insightful comments that uh, one of the issues that we don't spend much time talking about, what is is really a, a downside to the industry is profitability. And it's, it's profitability at the primary level, at the primary producer level, and it's profitability for those companies that you talk about that, that add the value. And somehow or another, we have to adjust that model. And it, it may be through additional research and, and development, um, but we have to figure that out because we're losing primary producers at a, at a startling and, and very frightening rate. Um, so I just add that point to, to the comments that you made, Ted. Great. Thank you. Uh, Nicola, I'd like to, to, to shift to, to a different question. You, we had talked about this earlier, but um, it builds on a question that's come up in the, in the chat as well. You know, one of the things that, again, we saw once again in this election is this divide between 
rural and, and, and urban Canada with, with largely urban, suburban Canada electing the government and, and rural Canada electing the oppo opposition. This isn't just a political issue. This, this certainly has policy consequences on, on the work that the government uh, does. One of, one of the, the, the questions that's come up in the chat, and I think builds off, off of your, your thoughts on this, but was around, uh, you know, so the, the, the government now has, has committed to reducing pesticide risks has, has uh, talked about a national water monitoring program. I was wondering how, how you see this, this dynamic playing out between, again, rural and urban Canada, between you know, the, the, the government now elected on a mandate to reduce pesticides and, and, and the reality that, that those pesticides play on, on farms uh, across, across the country. It, it, it's a good question, Tyler, and it, 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 it really illustrates the divide between, I would say, urban, and rural voters, we can say so, farmers and, uh, and citizens living in big cities. And I guess the, the, the one I will take is glyphosate, Rhonda. I mean, the farmers I cover in my stories are the, the one who does a, the best work at their farm are the one who use glyphosate in a manner that uh, how could I say? It's regenerate the, uh, the soil. So the best farmers use glyphosate just to control the, uh, I would say, the weeds. But uh, those farmers, those, those excellent farmers, they are before being, uh, I would say, a soya or a corn producer, they, um, they are worms. Uh, they, they raise worms, you know, like you know what I mean? Like the, this is the, 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 the symbolic of the, uh, of the fertility, earthworms. So like every, I would say like every uh, molecule, if I can say so, it's, it's true for penicillin, it's true for uh, uh, all kinds of, of a good molecule. When it works and when it's cheap, people abuse it. And glyphosate, we have to be honest. I mean, it's overused. So with that comes all the, uh, uh, come all the uh, I would say, uh, the, the recrimination from the people who doesn't know agriculture. If, if we were to, for instance, to cut glyphosate, how come, how will be, how, what will be the future of the, the, the good farmers? I'm not, I'm not trying to say there's bad farmers and big farmers it's, uh, and good farmers, but there is, there is too much use of pesticides. People don't want that. So we will have to have to look at biodiversity. We'll have to be, to be looking at agroforestry to put, you know, to better use nature instead of uh, 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 pesticides. And we are, and if we look at the future, it's not combining, or you could do it. I mean, you know, like you could use glyphosate with, uh, uh, other pesticides make a mix and things like that. But what, where are we going to be in 30 years? It's like penicillin, like, you know, like, a, so the soil, well, I'm trying to go back to the soil health. The soil health is like human health. If you use a little bit of glyphosate, if I have a headache and I, I use aspirin, you know, it's, it's, it's okay. But if I, if I overuse medication, then you're in bad shape. On top of it, the best way to fight climate change will have to have a, 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 a healthy soil. And if glyphosate can help that, uh, but now when you, go on a, when you go on a radio program and you try to explain those things, uh, you know, we live in a very polar, polarized world. And some people, they believe in the devil and uh, the glyphosate will be always the devil. So, you know, like uh, it's, it, we are caught here in a, and I guess it's, it will be our role, it's our role to try to explain without judging. But look, those are the facts. And yes, the farmers have to do, to do uh, something on their side to, uh, to use less pesticides and use more of nature. It will be to their benefit. It will be, it will be less costly at their farm operation and it will be healthy for, uh, for, their, for, their, for their business and their soil. So that's, I don't know if I'm, uh, you, I, if I explain it well, but this is a real, uh, a real issue uh, between, uh, I would say, rural voters or farmers and the general public who doesn't, under, you know, if you, if you see a product with a, uh, uh, a dead, uh, uh, you know, a, 
a dead uh, head on the products, like it says it kills. Well, uh, you know, everybody, uh, everybody is afraid of that. It's normal, but we have been using pesticides since, since the Romans, you know, in, in the vinery and things like that. So the, the, the dose make the poison, it how, how you use it. And, there, and then there is the science, and this is my last thought in that, when we're talking on the science side, look, who financed the science? That's the big issue. Is it Bayer? Is it, uh, is it, is it, is it, does it come from our researcher? We have to say that canola was developed by Agriculture Canada researcher, as well as some wheat breeds. So, you know, like uh, there's a big thinking to be, to be done there as who financed the research and how it can be more accepted by the general public. Well, and Nicola, I think your, your comments highlight how complex and dynamic uh, these policy issues are and, and how we have this need to try and, and explain these, these, again, very difficult systems to uh, a broad swath of the public in order to have support for that right policy mix. Uh, again, an, an example that's come up recently is, is the government commitments to reduce emissions from nitrogen fertilizer, right? You know, the, the, these are, that is a very simple comment to make, but, but, you know, I think we would all benefit from a lot of these topics, and, and Kathy is certainly a big champion of this, and it, of a more systems approach that understands about what the, the impacts are, right, from, you know, from, from the farm gate and before to, to the, the consumer plate and, and how uh, all of these different pieces in, interact um, together. Uh, sorry, would any of the other fellows have, have kind of thoughts or, or com comments on that? Maybe, Ted, I can switch to ask um, you a question. You know, COVID-19 certainly came out of out of uh, the blue, one of these black swan events that, that came along and, and changed everything. I was, was wondering if what your thoughts are around issues that are, that might be on the horizon. Um, that, that could come along and upset the Canadian agri-food policy apple cart. Hey, Tyler. Uh, first, if you don't mind, I'm going to disagree with the question a bit um, uh, no. by saying that, uh, you know, for me, there's, no, there's really very few true black swan events um, that occur. M many people, um, and in fact, some of our CAPI presentations for the last 10 years have been talking about the inevitability uh, in effect of a pandemic uh, you know we ran through SARS we ran th through H1N1 we knew a bigger one was coming and and to be you know, not to put too fine a point on it we know a bigger one than than COVID is coming um, and we we just need to be prepared but but the question goes to the heart of you know of something that we should be doing regularly which is asking ourselves that question about the risks every year and I know it's something Cappy's been contemplating for a while about doing a, a you know a yearly deep dive into the risks and the threats that to me because ultimately not only are they the things we have to survive um, to and to you you know for if we're going to flourish, but also the you know that's where the opportunities tend to lie is the flip side of those risks. So we're, I, I think it's fair to say we're, you know, we all have an idea that the, um, that the risks of climate change are out there. The risks of disease are enormous. You know, um, we know that fungi, bacteria, viruses, and prions are, are, are always there and they're, and, and they're a huge risk. But at the same time, very few people understand that we wouldn't have life without them. <laughs> Those are the drivers of life. And the and and you know we we wouldn't have it. We, so how do we live with these things is really the question, um, and and I think I think therefore that as as we look forward to you know at this we've got to understand that we're playing with an ecosystem which in some parts of the world is already in collapse. It's it's headed in that direction, and the um, and I think and understanding the risks that to to our own e economy and health are are extremely important. But one risk that I don't hear enough about, Tyler, and that I, I would hope we would we could maybe raise is the, the risks of what would happen if we lost half the port of Vancouver. And that could happen any day. Uh, the, you know, I, 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 I lived through the earthquake in Japan when I was there with the Kobe. 
and the and, and in the disruption to Canadian agriculture would be unbelievable. It's just, but we we have the opportunity. Uh, uh, the Port Authority has known about this, but they've not looked strategically at this at all. And the Canadian agriculture is not properly represented in in that uh, in, in, on on that board, and it needs to be because it would be near impossible to divert all of what we have through the east or back through the United States. The U.S. is going to be a long time digging their way out of their own crisis that they've got on their ports um, today. And I don't think we would want to be trying to add to that. So I just think the risk, the risk survey is, it is vital if we're ever going to understand where our real opportunities lie. Uh, other other thoughts on, on that question uh, or, or Ted's answer? Then then maybe what we'll do and, and again we're we're closing in on time so so I'll ask uh, what one last uh, question for, for everyone and, and maybe I should just say there, there's been some some really good questions in the in the chat that we're not going to be able uh, to get to uh, right now during our webinar for example uh, John Kelly was was is looking to hear from. From, from Ellen around, you know, how One Health is different from the concept of sustainability. So, so we've got a couple of questions like that. Uh, Brian Ennis had one, one for Ted. What we'll do is we'll, we'll follow up offline so that, that there is that opportunity uh, to engage and, and to, and to get, get answers to them. Um, but but uh, something that, Ellen, maybe go to you and give everyone an opportunity to ask this because I, I think it's, I think, you know, this, the, the reality that, uh, we operate in, in a national context. CAFI is a, a, a national uh, institute. Uh, we, we had a national election, but it was, you know, these are driven by regional differences and dynamics that are different across the country. We've got uh, food food chains, uh, supply chains that are, are different across um, the country as well. But but there's yet there's still so much that that connect us and, and you know so many commonalities uh, across the country as well. Again, let's start with Ellen and, and open it up to everyone as, as kind of our, our question to, to end on today. When you look ahead at the, the next four years, you know, how, how does this, how do these regional differences and commonalities play out? What, how, how is it going to, how do you think it impacts decisions that the government's going to make? And, and, and again, where, where do you see some of the opportunities uh, for agri-food food policy to go from, from here? Okay, um, I'm, I hope I'm still live. Um, yeah. I, uh, first of all, I do seem to travel across the country quite a bit in various aspects of what I do. And I see the discussions about agriculture varying quite a bit in different parts of the, um, of, of the country. So you know that although there are common concerns um, on the part of farmers, some of the fixes that get adopted in certain provinces are not considered to be suitable fixes in other provinces. Um, the glyphosate issue is one. For example, there's a different view in the West um, about the use of these things than there seems to be in the East. But the other thing that's interesting that we need to address head on is this rural urban divide. If it is, um, by the way, I have uh, views about whether the urban people can be brought on site or not, because I do think they're all passionate about food and they're also in, equally passionate about Canadian farmers and protecting Canadian farmers, even if they don't understand agriculture. But by the same token, um, political pressures are different in different provinces. And so sometimes we get decisions made, um, maybe um, not recognizing the needs in agriculture on the basis of urban concerns where they don't understand agriculture. And that could be happening in Ontario. And the people in Alberta feel very vulnerable to those decisions because they feel they're not representative in their province. So I think policy is really critical that we address these voices. But what I hate to see is that we waste research and innovation resources trying to prove points like Let's do more surveillance of, of how much pesticide is, is running off into water supplies in the West so that we can justify that we don't need to follow a national regulation about this because it's really a Prince Edward Island problem. It's a Quebec problem. It's not an Alberta problem. And that sort of stuff is going to get us nowhere. 
because we're viewed as a country um, by the rest of the world and we're dependent um, um, for our exports to be viewed as a country rather than to be viewed as purely provincial um, exporters. So I think it's really challenging for policy to address some of those fundamental differences it means getting farmers in a room, I think, to solve some of those problems, which we don't do that often at the policy level. Great. Uh, uh, other other thoughts or, or comments on, on the question and Ellen's answer? Uh, Susan? I loved your comment, Ellen. It was great. Um, and we, we talk so much in agriculture about livestock production or crop production. But the thing that is common throughout is we have people involved. So we have primary producers, we have everybody along the value chain, and we have the consumers. And I think they are all united by one common concern, and that is food safety and security. I think we do food safety really well in this country. I think we do food security quite poorly. And I think we need to really have a focus to see what it is that we can do on a systems level to make sure that everybody in this country has access to high quality food. So I'll just add that into your, your initial comments. Tyler, can I make one quick comment on that? Yes. Yep. Uh, I, I agree with um, both speakers. Um, I would just point out that sometimes um, you can do things that aren't research that have a much bigger effect sometimes than the research. And the, the one I'd like to give a, a shout out to is the work that was done on the film um, Guardians of the Grassland. That has had more impact, I think, on people that have seen it uh, than a lot than is if you put a science article in front of them. And it, it really brings home the importance of thinking in, in systems terms. And, and I think that's something that, that we, we could all agree on if we could get people to think in systems terms, but that was a, a brilliant way to show it. Great, Great. thank you. Uh, Nicola, so, you're, you're, sorry, just, Susan first maybe? Just jumping back in, Ted, I think uh, what you're illustrating is the need for communication between uh, all elements of our society. And you know, you're right, Ellen, there's an awful lot of people that are really passionate about farmers, but they don't have a clue what happens on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think that communication piece is just incredibly important. Sorry, Nicola, I didn't mean to take your... Oh, whoops, my, my micro is off. Uh, just to say, I think the um, it's communication. It's, uh, it's basically using facts and good communication. I haven't seen the, it's a movie, The Gardens of the Grassland. Uh, Ted, uh, I will certainly see it, but yeah, it's communication and uh, and explaining. But you cannot explain the word in a tweet. It has to be it has to be. Uh, you have to be prepared to explain to be uh, <laughs> to be on the ground too. That's basically. Uh, it, th thank you, Nicola, and, and and I think that's, that's a you know a, this last discussion has is a good point to to end on. Again, I, I talked at the. Uh, at the beginning about how um, policy development is a team sport and how uh, good policy development is, is developed when we, when we all work, work together on it. I think in the past, agriculture policy uh, was developed amongst um, the farm community. It was, you know, that, that team was, was, you know, the farm team, so to speak, that put it together. But that, that environment, that dynamic that we exist in today when we talk about agri-food policy that connects all of these different components is, is different than it was um, a decade ago. And, and so um, I think over the next year, we're really excited to see the work that, that you all do as Distinguished Fellows. I think uh, hopefully we'll see it help influence uh, what happens over the next four years and, and impacts the next mandate. And, and, uh, and we look forward to sharing the results of that project and, and to having um, you all engage with, with the, you know, those that were, were listening on, on the call today and and again, we'll follow up with, with those that had asked some specific questions to keep that dialogue going. Again, so thank you very much, everyone, for, for joining us uh, today. Uh, this is the first of a series of webinars we'll hold, hold this fall. Uh, stay tuned for some details uh, about our, our webinar at the end of October. I'll give you a, a sneak preview. It's on a topic that's of, of um, a passion of mine, and that's FPT relations and, and the dynamics of how that are playing out. So, 
So I think that that'll be a thr thrilling discussion. Um, we'll, we'll share news on that soon. Uh, and again, please reach out to CAPI at any time if you've got questions. Our, our fellows, as, as you've seen, are passionate about the topics that they're going to be working on, and I'm sure they all, all look forward to engaging with you all. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining today, and we look forward to seeing you at the next CAPI event. Have a great day.